Sports Center 6 presents Johnstown Hockey History. Here's your host, Tim Rigby. You might wonder how Jack Braun Wholesale Supply Incorporated in Hornerstown figures into the history of hockey in Johnstown. Well, believe it or not, this is where it all began. Jack Braun Wholesale Supply Company used to be the Schaefer Ice Palace. And this is where Johnstown's first hockey team, the Bluebirds, called home. The Bluebirds gave Johnstowners their first taste of minor league hockey. Although the Bluebirds did not last, their aftertaste did. They were here for just one season, the 1941-42 campaign. The faces may be familiar to just a few. The names may ring a bell for some of the area's older, hardcore hockey fans. The Bluebirds' appearance in Johnstown was not something that came out of long-range planning. In fact, the Bluebirds' presence in Johnstown was a gamble in more ways than one. A gentleman from down in Baltimore by the name of Pick Hines. And according to all things we ever heard, he was a horse player. One day he won a big bet. He was a native of Toronto. And the one ambition he always had was to own a hockey club. So he uh, backed uh, a team called Bo uh, in Baltimore. Uh, and uh, the other teams in the league were Boston, New York, and Atlantic City. And it was a four-team league that started the Eastern Hockey League. Uh, Pick had trouble making the ends meet. Uh, somewhere around Thanksgiving in 1940, uh, he heard about a hockey game in Johnstown. It was being played in the Schaefer Ice, or in Schaefer Ice Plant uh, out in Hornerstown. And he came in here to, to see the ball game. Now, he was astounded to see uh, the poor quality of hockey because it was a pickup teams from Pitt and Penn State that were uh, playing. And to see the house full and the crowd uh, very enthusiastic. So he decided that if the people of Johnstown would come out for this type of hockey, what would they do for real organized hockey? Uh, he asked the Eastern League to transfer the franchise from Baltimore to Johnstown. And he moved up here and uh, it did not catch on. Uh, the thing that uh, Pick Hines didn't realize was that the game that he saw was sponsored by the Ladies Auxiliary of the Memorial Hospital, and they had sold the place out probably two or three times. Pick Hines learned that selling tickets was much more difficult than giving them away. It was one gamble that did not pay off for him. Hines folded the team, and Johnstown native Harry Crichton whose nephew Jack would later be treasurer of the Jets took over, but Harry Crichton also ran into financial problems. I was in college at home for the winter vacation or Christmas vacation, and Harry called me one evening, said, would you like to drive into New York, have company? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So he, we lived in the same town in Westfield, New Jersey. He called, uh, stopped and picked me up. We went into into New York, and I didn't know why we were going, so I asked on the way, and he said, well, the hockey team has a little problem, Johnstown Bluebirds, and uh, going in there to pay their uh, hotel bill. So I think it was the Paramount Hotel up near the old Madison Square Garden. We went in there, paid their bill, they got in their cars and headed back to Johnstown. Conkle became involved late in the season when the club made a plea to the Johnstown Junior Chamber of Commerce, of which Conkle was the president. However, World War II brought an end to Johnstown Bluebirds hockey. The Schaefer Ice Palace was converted for industrial use, and the Bluebirds never took the ice again. We had a good team. Uh, we won the first place in the league. We won the first place in the playoff. But the thing it did most of all, it uh, whetted the appetite for hockey in Johnstown. But Johnstowners had a nine-year wait for hockey's return, and when it did, Kunkel was involved. As president of the Cambria County War Memorial Arena, he was on hand for the official announcement in May of 1950. After the war, uh, when it came time to build a war memorial uh, in a project that was led by Walter Krebs, the head of the Tribune Democrat, uh, there was no doubt about the fact it was going to be a sports arena. So as a result of this, uh, the war memorial was built and the Jets were started. The Johnstown Jets began their 27-year run in the 1950-51 season with a brand new building, the Cambria County War Memorial Arena. It was a different time for the sport back then. 
Hockey's interest was not as widespread as it is today, and the players had a more difficult time moving up. There were only six NHL teams. More than 90,000 fans turned out to watch the Jets in their initial season, and they put on quite a show. Under coach Wally Kilray, the Jets won the Eastern Hockey League regular season championship. And the fan favorites in that year included Crash Kelly, whose play on the ice earned him his nickname. Others who played well and had a good following in the 50s included Ivan Walmsley, Ken Coombs, Dick Raburge, and Don Hall. The tendency is to uh, shoot the puck a lot more than it was in our days. We used to maneuver the puck around. It was not a, a great offensive game. It was more of a defensive game back in those days, although the Eastern League was pretty wide open. It was tough. It was tough. You got, you had a lot of tough guys in the Eastern Hockey League and uh, um, they were crude. Some of them were very crude. I, I know a lot of kids that played for us and were good hockey players and you could see that maybe they could go somewhere and uh, they'd run into a, a Brophy or a Blake Ball and, and these guys would scare them and they'd say the heck with it. I'm going to go back home and go to school, which I think was a smart thing. Hall still lives in Johnstown, while Roberge is the golf professional at Island Green Golf Club in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Others who made an impact in Johnstown included Dave Lucas, Ken Lofman, Steve Berklesich, and Andy Brown. Although Hall, who spent 11 seasons with the Jets, never played in the NHL, he feels he and his teammates could have fared well at the top. I would hazard to guess that our 61-62 uh, uh, teams could have played as a team in the National Hockey League today, I think we had enough talent on it. We had three or four guys that went to the National Hockey League from that team that played there. Uh, uh, Marv Edwards, Eddie Johnson, uh, uh, Jim Mickle, and uh, these people played in the National Hockey League from those teams. Robbie Dawes was the next National Leaguer who played up there. and So that I think we could have played as a team and been very competitive. That team won the Eastern Hockey League championship in 1962, marking the Jets' third straight league crown. And one man who had a lot to do with the Jets' success was their general manager, John Mitchell. Great guy, tough, tough little guy. Uh, I mean, he could really build you up for a game. He'd come in there and start jumping around and hollering, and, and uh, he was just great. There were a lot of battles between the, man, between the owners and Mitch and between the coach and Mitch and between the players and Mitch. But uh, uh, his contribution to hockey in Johnstown is, uh, I think, unequal to anybody else's. Following the 1961-62 season, Mitchell moved up to the Detroit Red Wings organization. John Daly began a four-year run as the team's GM. And yes, it's the same John Daly who now wears the same hat for the Johnstown Chiefs. It was a rough four years. The unemployment back in those days was pretty high. I think the lowest it was in the four years was 14%, uh, and it was a high in 63 of 18%. Our uh, average attendance back then was like uh, maybe, well, if we got 900 people on Wednesday night, we were happy. The good old days weren't always so good. The Jets had financial problems of their own. In fact, a telethon in February of 1964, hosted by former WJAC TV sports director Bill Wilson, raised more than $40,000 for the team. That's probably a highlight of the four years, the way that people responded and kept us in business. Daly's duties ended in 1966 when Mitchell returned from the Red Wings front office. The Jets lasted 11 more years, and Dick Roberge was along for most of the ride as a player and then a coach. Although Roberge said he wasn't much of a coach, he loved playing. I never got off my wing. I was up and down the wing, and I could score goals. I, I'll say that. I, I was a good goal scorer, and I think that was all I was. I, uh, I wasn't a tough guy. I <laughs> didn't have very many penalties. And, uh, but I loved it. I loved every minute I played. From the late 1960s into the early 70s, the Jets fared well at the gate. In fact, just once from 1967 to 1972 did the Jets fail to go over the 100,000 mark in season attendance. Although the fans were there, a championship season wasn't. The Jets did have some good players. Reg Kent, Galen Head, and Ron Dockin were among the EHL All-Star selections. But it wasn't until 1975 when the Carlson brothers, Steve, Jack, and Jeff, along with Dave Killer Hansen were on the team, that the Jets were able to win a title. 
That year, they did it. And the Jets beat regular season champ Syracuse in the semifinals and then swept Binghamton for the North American Hockey League championship. It was a time when hockey fever ran high in the city and colorful players made it all the more exciting. this hockey club. This is one of the better hockey clubs that ever got together. Great harmony and great spirit and a great desire to win at all times. One of the best we've ever had in our lives. Just a great experience. We waited a long time for it and I hope we appreciate it. John's done. Everybody really enjoys it. It was a time when no one ever dreamed hockey would leave town. It was a time when young players, although hoping for a shot at the big time, could stop and enjoy their accomplishments. What really I really look back to is winning the championship, the feeling what it's all about, you know, when you uh, finally accomplish something, you, you know, granted it was the North American League, it wasn't the NHL or the WHA at the time, but you still have a championship. The Jets added an NAHL Western Division crown in 1975-76, but the following year would be the last for Johnstown. The team struggled on the ice, and financial problems again caused uncertainty for the team's future. The team, by that time run by five local businessmen, was put up for sale. There was no buyer, and the flood of July 1977 sealed the team's fate, signaling the end of the Jets' era. The team that won its first game against the Boston Olympics 5-1 in November of 1950 lost its final game to Maine 6-3 in March of 1977. Although the Jets are gone, they haven't been forgotten. In fact, several of them can still be seen in the movie Slapshot, which starred Paul Newman and was shot here in Johnstown in 1976. The cast of characters included Steve Carlson, the current Chiefs head coach, who portrayed one of the Hanson brothers. Probably when I played in Los Angeles, that was one of the main reasons why I was picked up from Edmonton, because uh, Hollywood's there. I made the movie with Paul Newman, a, a su successful movie, and uh, sometimes I wish they would recognize me as a hockey player instead of a movie actor, but it's kind of funny when you walk into a building and you see a whole section of people with the noses and the glasses, you know, it's the Carlson Fan Club in a, a visiting team's arena and the players get a chuckle out of it. Uh, even still now to my players in the locker room, every once in a while I'll throw out a line at me through the movie, you know, it's, uh, it gets kind of funny out there. But uh, I'm glad I made it. You know, it was a good experience. It has all its benefits. It's got me, you know, it opened a few doors for me in hockey. And uh, right now we're planning on making Slapshot too, so it's, uh, it's going to be something else. And if you haven't seen them in the movies, perhaps you've heard about them on network television. The team is a source for one of NBC sportscaster Bob Costas' favorite stories about his early days as a hockey play-by-play -play announcer in the old North American Hockey League. Memories of hockey in Johnstown. Now, for most of the history of the sport in Johnstown, it would be the Eastern Hockey League. But by the time I arrived on the scene as a 21-year-old senior at Syracuse University for the 1973-74 season, technically the league had changed its name to the North American Hockey League, but most of the old franchises and most of the old rivalries still existed. My immediate problem was to figure out how to broadcast hockey. I got the assignment about a week before the beginning of the season, and while I was pretty well versed in other sports, I was a novice to hockey, and I spent the week before the first game traveling around to exhibition games all around New York State, trying to master the simplest aspects of hockey, such as the rules, so that I would be ready for the first broadcast. That first broadcast involved riding the bus six or seven hours from Syracuse to Johnstown for this epic sports confrontation. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the Johnstown Jets versus the Syracuse Blazers. There was just one problem. As I sat in the booth about five minutes before face-off, working the game alone, acting as my own engineer, very worried, but I thought very well prepared, the Johnstown team skates out onto the ice, and for the first time, I'm guessing, since the Johnstown flood, John Mitchell, their legendary owner and general manager, had decided to pop for new uniforms, and all the numbers were changed. Well, I remember that one key member of the Johnstown Jets was Galen Head. That was an easy name 
to remember. That night, I decided that Galen Head would play a sensational game, and he, in fact, was everywhere. He assisted on his own goals. He stopped his own shots. He checked himself into the boards. When he didn't have the puck, I made him pass it to himself. Galen Head was everywhere because he was the only name I could definitely remember. It was certainly a memorable broadcast that first night. We came back to Johnstown several times that one season that I broadcast the games, and on one occasion in the playoffs, Jamie Kennedy, a winger for the Blazers, was hit in the head by some sort of projectile thrown by the, the normally cooperative and passive Johnstown fans. And this set off a, uh, a disagreement, a, a gentleman's disagreement, but it did lead to the Syracuse team barricading itself inside the visitor's locker room and a large group of Johnstown fans gathering in the hallway outside, banging on the walls like Santa Ana's troops at the Alamo. And, and I remember that some policemen arrived with dogs to try and disperse the crowd while a team bus pulled up to within this close of the side of the Johnstown War Memorial, a fine edifice which I hope is still standing, and we all slipped out, got right into the bus, and then somehow escaped. But they made the mistake of stopping uh, at some all-night spot about 10 miles outside of town because after all we were going to have to drive till dawn to get back to Syracuse and we need, needed some kind of a snack. And when we got there, four or five Johnstown fans were sitting in the bar and uh, apparently they'd been imbibing for a while and the next thing you know like something out of a b-movie chairs are flying around and dukes are flying and of course i had to eventually move in and uh, grab everyone by the scruff of the neck and clean the whole thing up and uh, and act as the peacemaker so my memories of hockey in johnstown are, are kind of like of a wild west show a, a rip roaring no holds barred not exactly uh marquee to queensberry rules kind of hockey but it sure was fun and it was the way my career started. When the 1977-78 season rolled along, the Johnstown Jets were history, and so was professional hockey in Johnstown. In fact, the only type of hockey you could find down here that year was played in the student hockey leagues. But Johnstown fans did not have a long wait for hockey's return because in the 1978-79 campaign, the Johnstown Wings were in operation. John Mitchell, who had been fired as general manager of the Jets, was back, and his Johnstown Wings competed in the Northeastern Hockey League. Dick Burge was called on to coach that team, and some former Jets latched onto the new club following Johnstown's one-year hiatus. But the Wings and Mitchell had a difficult year. The team, which Mitchell said had to draw 2,700 fans a game to break even, finished with a record of 25, 42, and 3. And the club lost money. The town later lost the Wings. But hockey did not die. Not this time. A local group worked to find another team, and they succeeded. The Detroit Red Wings put a farm club here for the 1979-80 season. The Red Wings were part of the new Eastern Hockey League. Marty Reed coached the team at the start, but did not last the season. Opposing coaches included Baltimore's Gene Ubriaco, who later spent time as head coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins. Even though Detroit sent some of its high-priced players to Johnstown, the Red Wings finished next to last in the league. The NHL club had problems of its own and decided to cut back. One of the cuts included the termination of the Johnstown Red Wings. Without an NHL affiliate, local hockey supporters were unable to finance a team. Efforts were made to secure an affiliation, but Johnstowners were left without a hockey team when the next season got underway. And it stayed that way until Henry Brabham of Virginia decided to bring his Virginia Lancers of the Atlantic Coast Hockey League to Johnstown for an exhibition game against the Erie Golden Panthers in February of 1987. Brabham was overwhelmed by the turnout. Hungry Johnstown hockey fans packed the war memorial. It was something Brabham did not forget. The following year, midway through the All-American Hockey League season, Brabham backed a Johnstown team. The Chiefs were born, and the club quickly had a large following. Area fans loved the Chiefs. Attendance was great, and finally, hockey was back. I was a little leery when Henry Braben came in and uh, said he was going to put a team in Johnstown, asked me to be the general manager, and after an absence of seven or eight years, I thought, <laughs> this is going to be brutal. And of course, I visualized the old people, uh, not the old people as per se, but uh, the, the fans uh, back as far as 1980 and the late 70s. I thought, how in the heck are we going to get them back? So we made a decision then we're going to go after the young people. And as you, it was a good decision. And uh, I can't take credit wholly for that, but uh, it was a great decision because we do have a young crowd. We have a good mixture. We have some of the old fans and uh, 
Our crowd is probably, is, it's young, but it's very enthusiastic. In 1989, the Chiefs made it all the way to the ECHL Championship Series before losing to Carolina. Attendance figures are still up, and weekend sellouts are commonplace. It's a small town atmosphere where people work to get ahead in life, and uh, that's what they expect from the players, and that's what I expect from the players. You work hard, no matter if you win or lose, you're still winners, and they'll back that. There have been some lean years in Johnstown's hockey history, but now local management is enjoying the benefits of its rebirth. And Daly and Carlson both feel hockey is here to stay. Oh, it's excellent. I just, uh, that's the reason you knock yourself out so much to try to get a team out in the ice that the fans like. We are probably the, the, the most solid team in the league right now. We know we're going to get the people in the arena. Just as long as myself and John put on a competitive team on the ice. And the fans have what they want. The city's hockey history is a rich one, starting with the old Blue Birds who played in the Schaefer Ice Palace in Hornerstown. The War Memorial Arena is home to Johnstown's fifth hockey team. It all started there with the Jets, who competed first in the Eastern, then in the International, back to the Eastern, and finally in the North American League, then the wings of the Northeastern Hockey League the Red Wings of the new Eastern League, and now the Johnstown Chiefs of the East Coast Hockey League. It's been about 50 years since professional hockey made its first appearance in Johnstown with the Pittsburgh Hornets and Pittsburgh All-Stars scoring off at the Schaefer Ice Palace. It has certainly changed a lot since then. The Johnstown Chiefs are a big hit among the hockey fans in Johnstown, and proof of that has been the impressive attendance figures over the years. And now the Johnstowners have hockey back, it appears to be here to stay. The ECHL, like the Chiefs, is another success story. The league continues to expand with three teams added for the 1990-91 season and three more scheduled for the 1991-92 campaign. That pretty much covers it, from the Bluebirds to the Chiefs. Thanks for joining us.